Welcome back to lecture two on the Middle Ages. You'll remember in the last lecture, we talked about how we were combining chapters five and six because chapter five was on the Middle Ages and chapter six was on Christendom, which was that, you know, influx of Christianity in that time period and how it affected uh, so much of the art form and civilization, architecture, that sort of thing. This lecture is going to focus in particular mostly on um, the architecture and the art from this period. So the first thing we're going to talk about is the Middle Ages and the Romanesque style. We see this style in architecture, we see it in sculpture, um, and other art forms. So um, here you see a picture of a church that is in a Romanesque style, and we'll be talking a lot more about that. So when it comes to Romanesque, it basically means Roman-like. And this was a time where people were rediscovering the Roman forms, art forms, even if not rediscovering Roman techniques. So the primary goals of builders were to enclose and illuminate interior spaces. They used small windows. Um, they were learning to use an incombustible masonry to help protect the relics. Because remember, we spoke in the last lecture about how so many of these churches, um, it was about housing the relics. Um, and we talked about how they went from building with wood, which was very combustible, to using stone. And so now we're also going to see um, some masonry added to that stone. The floor plan of a Romanesque church follows that Latin cross design that we talked about in the earlier Christian and Carolinian churches. Um, we also talked about that in the previous chapter four on religion. And this new system of stone vaulting that they're going to use as medieval architects is going to build on a grander scale than ever before. It's going to provide opportunities to build even bigger buildings, even grander buildings. Um, and again, remember how we said that religion was a huge focus um, during this Middle Age period. So they want to build better and bigger churches, cathedrals, if you will. So the architects enlarged that eastern end of the floor plan to include a number of radiating chapels. And so by extending this, they'll have more room to house more relics. And when we're talking about relics, let me just be clear, okay? It could be the bones of a saint. It could be some other um, possession of somebody that was, you know, a famous religious type figure. Um, these were considered to be, you know, very valuable in, in, in that intrinsic religious um, kind of way. So housing these, these would be places that people would pilgrimage and come to to see these relics, as if seeing these and being near these would somehow, you know, do something for you as a person or you as a Christian. They also extended the side aisles around the transept and behind the apse to form what we call an ambulatory, which was a walkway. Um, now this allowed, you know, anybody that might come into the church to view the relics while maybe a mass is going on or whatever, they could walk around and not interfere with what was going on with the priest. Most Romanesque churches belong to the monastic complex. Um, you remember we talked about how the monastery would have that big complex um, and be kind of a self-contained community. But most of these, but some of these um, cathedrals um, were urban cathedrals, okay? They were in a town, in a city. Um, not all of them were part of, many of them were belonging to that monastic um, 
complex, but some were urban cathedrals. Now, some background. They employed round arches and a uniform system of stone vaults in the upper zones of the nave, which was, remember that center aisle, and the side aisles. The typical floor plan, again, was that Latin cross. Remember, that's the one where um, the, the Greek cross, remember, was an equal distance between the horizontal and the vertical crosses were, were an equal space from each other, whereas the Latin cross had that cross a little bit further up on the floor plan. The Latin cross design was the early Christian and Carolingian churches. The new system of stone vaulting gave them the ability to make these churches even bigger. Most Romanesque churches belonged to that monastic complex as we discussed. Now, architecture in Romanesque was the dominant art form. It was all about the architecture. There were massive proportions, very thick walls, an emphasis on horizontal elements, semicircle arches, small windows, and dark interiors. The Latin cross plan and sometimes even a Greek cross plan might be used. There were barrel vaults. Okay, notice these barrel vaults. This is at the Saint Cernan in Toulouse, France. Notice these beautiful barrel vaults, all right? And you see that those are made out of that um, <clears throat> masonry type structure. A lot of cross vaults. Um, no this is another picture of Saint Cernan in Toulouse, France. Notice you've got that center aisle, remember the, the, the nave, and then you've got the side aisles um, that are blanketed by <clears throat> these lovely arches. Um, and then you've got this space over on this side that's a walkthrough that people can walk through. Um, the Notre Dame La Grande is a hall church. Um, and we'll be talking a lot about um, Notre Dame. Here is an aerial shot of the Saint Cernan in Toulouse, France. Um, this was considered a pilgrimage church. Notice it's got the Latin cross plan. You've got this nave, the center aisle. You've got these side aisles, okay? There's two of those that are created by those arches, okay? And those tall, you know, columns. Notice you've got this ambulatory. Remember we talked about how there would be a walkway, like you can walk all the way around the outside of this floor plan, okay? Um, <clears throat> you've got side chapels where there would be maybe some relics housed. Um, so again, you know, people could walk in on a pilgrimage or to visit this church without disturbing what might be going on right here. Like there could be a service going on um, and it would not, you know, disturb what was going on. You've also, you can see this cross plan, right, from this aerial shot. Um, the nave of San Cernan is typically Romanesque. It's got very thick walls. Okay, look at how thick these are. Um, closed spaced piers, engaged columns, and a tunnel, barrel vault, tunnel vault, that covers <clears throat> that whole um, section of that nave. All right, and just lovely tunnel vault created right there. Now, the altar faces east toward Jerusalem, and this was a very, very important um, aspect of these churches or these cathedrals. Um, you've got what's called, um, you've got a wider transept, okay? You've also got buttressing. This was regular. You've got... Um, nice little areas that help support. All right, we'll see some flying buttresses when we look at Notre Dame. Um, you also see tall towers, okay? These are the most important building um, around the church, okay? So there's always gonna, you usually have that tower and that's gonna be where the most important um, part is of the church.
<clears throat> remember what we said about barrel vault. Semicircle and cross section capable of spanning large distances in railways, churches, and cathedrals. All right, so another thing we want to talk about is the Romanesque sculpture. One aspect of the Romanesque sculpture is the tympanum. This is the semicircular section within the arch of the portal. That's above the doorway, okay? So you see that semicircle arch above the doorway, which in Romanesque churches is often sculpted. And so you see beautiful sculpture there. Um, <clears throat> the typical tympanum composite depicts Jesus in the center, always the largest figure, and it's surrounded by what's called a mandorla which is a, is a glory of light in the shape of an appointed oval. So here you've got, you know, this, this whole thing would be the tympanum, and then you've got this mandorla, and you notice in the center of that would be Jesus, okay? We also have things a lot like this, some other sculpture that um, <clears throat> Mary's architecture with sculpture is in Cambodia. You're going to see a lot of structures like this in Cambodia. This is the Angkor Wat in Cambodia. And you notice they've got, you know, these beautiful pointed domes, right? All sculpted out of whatever this material is, whether it's stone or whatever. So a lot of the architecture itself is sculpture and it becomes kind of like the predominant force. We have another visual here of an, a Romanesque church portal. Um, so notice you've got the, um, lintel going across. You've got this whole semicircle thing that is the tympanum, right? Here you've got the jam, um, you've got some jam columns, um, what's called the trumeau, the voussoirs. But remember that tympanum, that half or that semicircle. All right. <clears throat> Notice here. Here we have a west tympanum of the Saint Lazare um, Autun in France. Um, you've got the tympanum, right? This one is the sculpture is showing us the last judgment. And here you see it actually on above that doorway um, in the actual church itself. <clears throat> also part of the Romanesque style, in painting, um, there are very, very few murals that have survived. Most important are in the Church of St. Savin sur Gartempe in France. Um, and so you see some of those um, along the walls here. There's inaccuracy of pairs of animals and the human body shows that study from nature was not part of an artist education. The purpose of these paintings, these murals, was to illustrate biblical tales and give clarity with which the narrative is related and it's of greatest importance. Remember, a lot of people were not reading and writing, but they could read the pictures, okay? So murals were one way that they could learn about biblical stories. Another <clears throat> Romanesque style was the manuscript illumination that we've spoken of before. The manuscripts were handwritten books. The pictures are referred to as illuminations rather than illustrations. Almost all of them had this luminescent appeal with light shining from within. Um, the manuscripts, again, we've spoken before about them being written on prepared animal skins like parchment or vellum. There would be a medieval scribe who would write the text with a reed or a quill pen and ink, and they would leave spaces for these illuminations, spaces for the pictures. Um, there was a belief that the beauty of the book indicates the importance of the message contained within. So the, the stronger the message, the more important the message is, the more illumination the book would have. There were another common practice during this time were um, the types of manuscripts that were bestiary. They were book 
Books of Beast. And this contained kind of like an encyclopedic kind of compilation of animal lore and symbolism, which provided moral models for readers. Today, we would call these fables. You know, we had like Aesop's fables. Um, you may have heard some of those stories when you were growing up, and they used animals as the, as the main characters because that would appeal to children. Um, so these bestiaries uh, books, these Book of Beasts, were a lot like that. Um, they used animals and stories about animals to help teach lessons. All right, now we've talked about the Romanesque style. Another very important style during this time period is the Gothic style. Now, 17th century neoclassist sorry, coined the term Gothic um, to describe the rude and barbarous architectural style that followed the Romanesque style. Now, when we think of Gothic, we're not thinking of people wearing, you know, dark clothing and having a dark air about them that we call Goths. No, okay? This is a style, an architectural style that's called Gothic. Um, while the Romanesque architects employed that Greco-Roman type principles and techniques for churches that hugged the ground, the Gothic architects developed new ways to make these monumental sanctuaries soar upward to the heavens. So Gothic cathedrals were recognized as a majestic expression of the age of faith. So bigger is better, and you're going to see that in the Gothic um, architecture. These are going to be monumental churches. They go beyond church. They are cathedral. They are huge. Now, Paris... France dominated this later Middle Ages, and Gothic is applied to that art that developed or formed about 1140 onward in France. Gothic, again, re loosely refers to time between that fall of the Roman Empire and the Renaissance, hitting its height in about the 1300s. Now, Gothic architecture is characterized by lightness. You're going to see a lot more light and soaring spaces. The flying buttress um, is a, an architectural technique that is going to make building bigger and bigger and bigger churches possible. Cathedrals often had not just one tower, but two towers. We call those twin towers. And they had a lot of stained glass windows, which usually included a central rose window in a bar tracery. And we're going to see examples of those. Now, this Gothic architecture movement started to wane in the 14th and 15th century. Here you see a, an example of a rose window and these smaller little windows that are called lancets. And this is at the Chartres Cathedral in France. So, the rose window was a round window. Okay, and this is the south rose window in the lancets in that particular church. But it was a round window, and you had like little rosettes um, around it. Beautiful detailing. Beautiful. And here you have some, some key um, stained glass pictures of um, important maybe saints or important figures in the Bible. Now... <clears throat> This information is not in your textbook, so you're going to want to pay attention to this. All right, so we talked about bar tracery. So notice how you've got this lovely little pointed arch, okay, uh, for a window. But then you also have this little, these bars that are placed inside that window opening, okay, that create a lovely new look. Okay, and we call this bar tracery. And so it can create an intricate design, but it adds just a, a lovely element. The flying buttress. Okay, so if you have a flying buttress, and we'll talk a lot about these, all right, um, these help provide support. Okay, um, and these are going to be an interesting architectural design element. This is that Chartreuse Cathedral in France. Remember, we talked about the rosette window. Here's another rosette window. 
Um, notice you've got the twin towers, right? As we talked about with a Gothic cathedral. Um, you've got pointy, a lot of points. You're going to see a lot of points um, in a Gothic designed piece of architecture. This is in Moscow. This is St. Basil's Cathedral. Um, and so you've seen this pictured in so many different things when it connects with um, with Russia. Okay, and you've got these beautiful little, you've still got the points, right? But you've got these interesting kind of bubble uh, onion dome shapes, um, little Russian flair there. This is inside the 12th century Canterbury Cathedral. Notice you've got these um, lovely, um, a nice wide nave aisle, right? You've got these beautiful cross vaults, okay? Are groin vaults within that structure. Here you've got a picture of Notre Dame in Paris. This is one angle. This is St. Patrick's Cathedral in Dublin, Ireland. So again, you start to notice certain things about um, the Gothic architecture. Here is a lovely depiction of Notre Dame, one of the most famous cathedrals um, in the world. A few years back, Notre Dame caught fire and it was just devastating, not only to that city of Paris, but to the country and to the, to, um, the world because it was so well renowned. Now notice you've got, um, here you've got, there's a chapel here. You've got the choir would be in here. Um, you've got the belfry where the, the bells are. You've got the flying buttresses that come off of this piece and onto this piece to provide additional support. You've got the two towers. Um, and I think we can see those, you know, this is like the front of it, okay, where those two towers are. Um, you've got a transept spire. You see lots of spires, those pointy. Um, here's the front. You can see that rose window. Um, you can see the two bell towers. You see the spire, um, the stained glass, the flying buttresses coming off. Um, so lots of interesting architectural structures. So after the fall of the Roman Empire, Christianity begins to flower and papacy rose, having a pope in that concept, which this demands bigger churches, right? So as Christianity gets bigger, these churches get bigger and there are more of them. Cathedrals were the seats of bishops. There's a famous cathedral building builder, Char uh, Chartres Cathedral. Um, why we, which is why we call this, you know, cathedral. It used circles, square, and triangles to create greatness in architecture. So you see those, those uses of those geometric shapes. Now, some other various architecture that we see in this pre-Renaissance Europe. Castles were built as feudal fortifications. Um, architecture changed as a result of those crusades and technology of siege warfare. And in that feudal system, the castles ne were necessary for protection, but less so in the Renaissance, which is going to see a growth in towns. Um, there also is this advancement of stone cutting tools. Remember, we've gone from you know, making things out of wood to making things out of stone and masonry. So having those different tools needed um, also, you know, an important component. Now, some in another region of the world, in pre-Columbian South America, um, you see some structures that look like this, okay? You've got, they had no metal tools that were used. The stone is granite or diorite, almost like diamonds, and the stones fit together perfectly. So again, you know, within us, we've talked about this before, within the same time period, you have different levels and stages of development for civilization. This is pre-Renaissance Asia. Um, a lot of their buildings were a timber framework with a stone foundation. Um, the Buddhist, the Taoist, 
and Confucius, they had their own types of tem uh, temples. Here's that Angkor Wat one in Cambodia again. Here's one in China. Um, this is the Forbidden City, Beijing, China, um, which was, you know, operated or occupied by emperors from 1300, 1300 to 1911 AD. Here is a castle in Japan, okay? This one is called the Great White Heron. Here's some architecture in the Middle East and in Africa. Of course, in the Middle East, they had mosques. Um, the mosque would have very symmetrical plans, prominent minarets, you know, because we've talked about these small little um, tower-looking structures that would have a dome on them. Those are minarets. Dentiform archways that would have an onion-shaped dome, and they would have sub-domes that might also be onion-shaped. Here is um, in Petra, Jordan, in the first century A.D., carved sandstone tomb. It's carved out of this, you know, mountain or this hill. Here's the oldest mosque in Africa. This one is in Libya. This was made of mud and palm tree branches. And then here's an Ethiopian church um, out of brick and mortar. So, you know, we see all kinds of structures, but that, that idea of religion in the church um, in whatever form it is for that religion was very important. In Italy in the later Middle Ages, you know, you've got... Um, painting that's going to happen, especially centering in that city of Florence. Um, materials and methods, they would do frescoes. Um, some calamities going on during that later Middle Age was the Black Death, the plague. The Hundred Years' War was also going on. The philosophy during this time period is the growth of universities, the scholastic school scholasticism by St. Thomas Aquinas. Um, and you had St. Francis of Assisi, which many people have heard of, that was so instrumental in um, taking people in and blessing animals and all of these things. And you even have um, structures devoted to him. There are some big changes in music during these Middle Ages. Um, first, there was plain chant, and this was just a form of medieval church music that involved chanting or words that were sung. No, you know, instruments used to accompany this. Um, it's also called plain song, um, and you've got a, a link to a video there that you can play that um, gives you the sound of that. Uh, the Gregorian chant is also a very famous um, type of music, if you will. It's monophonic, meaning one, you know, kind of sound or unison, and it's used in liturgical music of the Roman Catholic Church. It's in that 14th century that medieval music undergoes significant changes. Um, including the displacement of church music by secular music. I mean, eventually there's going to be music for everyday folks, not just for people in church. Eventually there are going to be drinking songs and the music that, that drew on the everyday um, being composed and performed as often as that devotional music that was inspired by religious faith. And then, of course, there's the polyphony. Polyphony, the style of simultaneously combining a number of parts, each forming an individual melody and harmonizing with each other. So music is transforming and eventually will be secular. Literature also is very important in this time period. There were troubadours, people that would go around singing stories. Um, there were guild and mystery plays that were being performed. There were great pieces of literature like Dante's The Divine Comedy. This was an Italian um, piece of work by an Italian author. It's a long narrative poem that's written in Italian um, about 1308 to 1321. Um, it's usually held to be one of the world's great works of literature. It was divided into three major sections, the Inferno, 
Purgatorio and Paradiso. The narrative traces the journey of Dante from darkness and error to the revelation of the divine light, culminating in the beatific vision of God. Now, he invents the terza rima form. And this is where you rhyme the first and the third lines that gives each tercet a sense of temporary closure. Rhyming that second line with the first and last lines of the next stanza generates a strong feeling of propulsion. So this is an important work by him, but also, um, you know, the creation of this different kind of rhyme scheme was also very important. Now, there were two writers that were very transitional writers. Um, one of those is an Italian. It's Boccaccio. Um, he wrote a narrative that was told from the view of seven women and three men. This was called the Decameron. Now, then you have Geoffrey Chaucer, a famous English writer. He's influenced by Boccaccio's work, Decameron, and he also writes a story. His is a frame story. It's a story within a story. So he frames this story as there are um, pilgrims, people that are on this religious pilgrimage, and interestingly, they come from all walks of life. It's not just a story about people that are at higher social um, and socioeconomic levels, but it includes people from every level, including the peasant level. Now, that's the frame. That's the frame on which this story is told. Within that story is the story that to pass the time, they're all going to the tomb of Thomas O'Beckett that's at one of these churches, and they're going to see the relics. This is part of their pilgrimage, and it's quite a long journey. So to pass the time, each one of these pilgrims, each one of these people, are going to tell a, a story on the way up and a story on the way back. Now, originally, there were going to be a total of 144 stories um, because each there were a certain number of pilgrims and each would tell a certain number of stories on the way up and on the way back. Well, needless to say, Chaucer died before he was able to tell all of these stories, so it's an unfinished work. But what we get is this interesting cross sampling of the population and get to see some different views about life from their perspective. So it becomes this wonderful work of art that is still studied today. Now, when we think about the legacy of the Middle Ages, right, you have those thousand years following the fall of Rome. And this was that time of classical Christian and Germanic traditions that coalesced to usher in the rise of the West. Then you had Western Europeans developing that rugged, warring society tempered by feudal loyalties and the otherworldly ideals of the Roman Catholic Christianity. You had the synthesis of these earlier traditions that gave the Middle Ages its fundamental character and its prominent landmarks, and these in turn would anticipate the vibrant culture that, that we know of as medieval Christendom. Now, that period between 1000 and 1300 um, could be called that age of faith. That medieval Christendom left a number of institutions and artifacts that have come to shape the culture of the West. In political life, the beginnings of European monarchy. In economic life, we see the rise of towns. In higher education, we see the university develop. In religion, we see the Roman Catholic Church develop. And in the arts, we get this flowering of master works ranging from allegorical drama and epic poetry to Gothic cathedrals and polyphonic music. The centuries to follow would witness and transition from medieval to modern values as Christendom entered or encountered increasing secularism and a revival of classical humanism. So when you think about that legacy of the Middle Ages, they left the world with lasting elements of philosophy, religion, education, music, architecture, and art. Now, I want us to take a look at some famous 
architectural wonders. Just because as you're starting to learn about some of these new architectural techniques, it is, it's an awesome way for us to um, explore, experience, and appreciate some of these. Now, this is a church in Normandy in Brittany, France. It's called Mont Saint Michel. This was built within the 10th to 16th centuries. Notice it is, you know, out literally surrounded by water. In fact, let me show you when high tide hits, this is what it looks like. Now, you can see the cars, you can see the people lined up to see this. Um, so look at some things about this church. We notice those pointy um, towers and spindles. So this leads us to believe that we're dealing with a Gothic church, right? Beautiful structure. There it is at low tide. Here is a famous piece that many of you have seen before. This is um, the Leaning Tower of Pisa, also called the Bell Tower. This is in Pisa, Italy, um, built around 1174 CE. Um, you notice there was a shift in the land, and so we have that leaning appearance. Notice you see some of the, um, a very Romanesque look to it, right? Because you've got the columns, you've got the arches that are created, and they go all the way around. Um, so another beautiful architectural wonder. This is a closer view of that Angkor Wat, so that you can again see the sculpture is so big of a part, is such a big part of this um, structure. This is Chartres Cathedral, the Cathedral of Notre Dame. This is the front facade, okay? Notice this, I mean, as you, in these doorways, I mean, they're cut in. You have these beautiful pointed arch looking areas. You've got the tympanum right there, beautiful rosette windows, beautiful little details in the architecture. Here are the spires where you can see those. Here is a famous view of this. Here you really see these flying buttresses. These are on the back and the flying buttresses help bear the weight, right? And so they those allowed this to be built so high um, and still be able to, to hold that structure up. This is an illuminated manuscript. Another piece of artwork, we would say, from this period, Joshua bidding the sun to stand still. Um, so you can see the beautiful um, gold leaf on it um, and lovely illumination of that story. This is Jesus entering Jerusalem. This is a painting by Giotto. And this is a, a fresco on the walls of the Arena Chapel. Beautiful. This one's called Lamentation over the Body of Jesus. This is a fresco. This is also on the wall. Um, you might remember this piece. We looked at this piece early on in Humanities. Remember, normally the subject would be centered in the middle, um, the most important subject, but everything goes this way. But you follow the length of the body of Jesus. Here's another depiction of Dante in his poem. This one's done by Domencio di Michelino. This is a fresco. This is on a wall um, in, the, in a cathedral in Florence, Italy. Um, and I've got an up-close picture so that you can see he's actually holding uh, um, his book um, in his hand. And you can see the church in Florence right there. You can see those different circles um, of hell, if you will. And here is a depiction or an explanation of his circles of hell that can be found in the part of his work called Inferno. You've got the first circle of hell is limbo, then lust, gluttony, avarice, and prodigality. Uh, wrath and sullenness are the fifth circle. The sixth is heresy, then violence, fraud, and treachery. 
Notice what it says about tre treachery. Betrayers of special relationships are frozen in a lake of ice. Satan, Judas, Brutus, and Cassius are here. Remember, Cassius and Brutus were two friends of Julius Caesar that were part of that assassination of knifing him in the back. Um, so, and Judas, of course, was the one that, that um, denied Jesus right or he sold jesus out right um so and of course we know who satan is so i hope that you've seen in these two lectures that the middle ages were a very important time period they were important to architecture they were important to literature they were important to painting and sculpture and society as a whole um and they give us so much of what we see today in the way of um, architecture and sculpture, painting, all of those areas, it goes back to this time. A lot of what was done during this time was taking those Greco, Greco-Roman ideals and adding to those, changing those, working with those. So again, we're seeing that all those foundations that were set back in early times we're seeing those brought forward and revisited. All a neoclassicist is, is someone who revisits the classics and decides what to do with those, how to, to add on those, how to improve upon those. And that concludes our lecture two on the Middle Ages. I look forward to, to speaking with you again soon.